Uh, welcome everyone back from lunch. I hope you still have some uh, mental capacity uh, to follow a couple of more talks. Uh, please welcome Andrew Turner. He's going to talk about fuzzing FreeBSD. OpenBSD, sorry. Please welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, well, I say the kernel, but I won't. I'm, I am a FreeBSD committer. I'm not just going to talk about FreeBSD. I, will, I have looked at the state on FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD. So this is about myself. I'm a FreeBSD, as I said, I'm a FreeBSD committer. Uh, you may have previously seen me doing things like ARM64 support. Uh, I'm a research associate at the University of Cambridge. So if you were in Brooks's talk this morning on Cherry ABI, I work on this, this, the same project where we, we're doing, uh, trying to add more add security by default into hardware and therefore into your software. And sometimes I pretend to be a, a, a freelance software engineer if people feel like paying me money. Uh, so I'm going to start off with Talking about the sanitizers, so even though this talk is on, I said it was on fuzzing, it's sanitizer without, yeah, the sanitizers are useful because for the fuzzing, and as I'll, I'll sort of explain. And for sanitizers, I want to say, well, you've got some code. What, do you know about the quality of your code? I, you know, you, we've got this big piece of code we call the kernel. There's lots of different parts of it. What? How, what's the quality? Is it, is it, are there many buffer overflows leading to somehow, somehow exploiting the system? Are, there, are we accidentally leaking memory and therefore leaking some, some information that a user shouldn't get access to? You know, what do we know? Do we have a way of figuring this out? So the, the sanitizers, what, how they work, you know, they're, they're just, you can think of it as an instrumentation of your code in some way. It's, they're all, it's generally the compiler will be doing this. We're inserting a function call somewhere in the code, depending on the sanitizer. So there's some that could say if you're entering into a basic block or in, insert a function call there. Uh, some will, if you're doing a comparison to see what, your, what memory you're comparing, or if you're doing a load or store it will insert a, uh, a function. And, and then exactly what we do with it is, is the, there's a runtime that will handle this. And user, user space, uh, the Clang or GCC will provide you a runtime, hopefully. Uh, not so much in the kernel. We have to, we have to do this all ourselves because uh, it's just always a special environment. Yeah, undefined behavior is always a favorite to... Uh, so the user, the user space undefined behavior sanitizer, and so the kernel equivalent, which always usually starts with a K. It, um, much of many, there's a lot of undefined behavior we can maybe be able to do, detect in the compile time, but a lot of it is only runtime detectable. Uh, things like misaligned, uh, or null pointed dereference. So you accidentally, you, I saw, found actually, ran into this recently where you accidentally get given a null pointer somehow and you can't possibly detect this because it comes from user space and you're just missing a null pointer check. Or you may be shifting by a, a variable amount and that, might, that value may be 64 and you're on a 32 bit int, which is well outside of its range. Um, Thanks to NetBSD, we have the micro UBSAN uh, runtime, which uh, I have I uh, imported the previous. So NetBSD has committed it uh, over a year ago, and I imported it um, late last year. And, Net and OpenBSD has done did the same this year. Uh, you do get some issues though. Uh, oh, can be a wee bit big, but I'll show you. So here are three examples I found in, in FreeBSD. Uh, you can, 
yeah, trying to trying to alignment issues often is often a, 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 a case where the compiler may actually assume you know, assume you've told it that it's going to be 128 byte aligned, and then you give it a 64 byte aligned thing. I've seen plenty of many cases where that happens, and then suddenly you're reading the wrong thing, and you could easily turn this into a security vulnerability. Uh, no, uh, this no point of the reference is actually this is using trying to find the offset of a value inside a strut by taking the strut, uh, casting null to this type of the, the type, and then finding the address of the the entry you want. Uh, there is actually there's now I think Clang definitely has a a way of doing this. Uh, I think uh, I expect GCC will have the same way. Um, don't just cast null to a strut, please, anymore. And there'll be things like shift south of bound. So this is all things that um, you can't assume, you know, the compiler will can make certain assumptions that you're not going to ever do these. Uh, and if you do, if you, uh, the compiler could do anything if you um, hit a um, under home behavior or a moose. It could, it could, <laughs> it, it don't require, don't rely on undefined behavior ever across, you know, not changing across uh, compiler versions, compiler, you know, two different compilers. Uh, GCC and Clang will probably do something different with your undefined behavior. Uh, Clang eight and nine. They could do something. There was, a, there was examples of uh, new uh, adult Clang 9 will now, if, if it can show that a variable is const and you're, and you're writing to it, it can say, oh, that can't possibly happen. It will just drop that, that store in, in some cases. So, yeah, don't, if you can, if you, yeah, don't join behind, don't try to remove your undefined behavior if you can. Okay, so that one that was sort of the easy one. That was NetBSD added it. Um, there were some issues with we haven't enabled it. We can't enable three able to by default because it blows the kernel size, but it's possible to build kernels that will will work. But um, the second one is is this a coverage sanitizer. So when the compiler you know, when you're running your code, what how does you run, you run a system call, where does, where does the kernel code, I mean, what, what paths through your code does it take? So it will use, uh, it, it inserts traces into, into the compile, into your code to say, I've uh, entered into a new function, or I am now running this if, if statement, and here is the two values that you're comparing, and some information about it, about what size, what, with so this comparison is, um, so it can be. This one's actually very powerful, and it's um, all three of OpenBSD, FreeBSD, and NetBSD have have added support for this, which we'll see later exactly why. Um, so you know, they this is a, this has been done. Uh, the I the FreeBSD code originally started. Uh, as a co-op student at Ed Masthead, and then I took o I took the code and worked on it a bit more, and uh, got it. We I managed to get it committed. Um, so it will do things like this. So we have a buffer. We 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 ask the kernel for a buffer, and uh, we it starts off with just the, you know, the number of entries in the buffer, the number of valid entries in the buffer, and just the list of, of basic blocks it's gone to, or program counters inside the basic block. The actual, you can just imagine, it doesn't have to be an actual PC value. It could be, uh, it just has to be something unique in each, each play, location that a, a, a tool could then use. Um, uh, FreeBSD and NetBSD, both, these are all 64, but OpenBSD, it's, uh, whatever you and pointer T is, so it could be so it's 64-bit on a 64-bit architecture, uh, and it's, yeah, it's probably the just, normally it's just the return address of the function. It's the, the exact value doesn't actually matter that much as long as they're un unique. Uh, 
so this is good for if you wanted to find out just how your just just what path you you took through the code. Um, but then there's some issues of well, okay, I want to then try a different path through the code. How do I modify my input to figure this out? Well, there probably there's some if statements in there, but we don't know where. Um, they're just addresses that may may be related to the if statement. Uh, so we have this comparison trace, which is a this one's the is very useful for for fuzzing, where we have the same thing. We have the number of entries. Uh, the the exact num the number of entries is slightly different in this, and this number of these different groups of of uh, values. Um, where we can see and say, well, we now know, okay, so two means, I don't know exactly what two, like a eight byte comparison, for example, um, um, and it's, it might be you know, the two values that they're comparing, so hex 10, hex 20, and the address that this comparison, approximately the address, you know, the, a value for where the comparison was. And then you have a second comparison later. So you can imagine if we've got some input input data we've, we're passing in, and then we see it in here, and it was a failed comparison, maybe if we change it, would could if we change it, could we try finding a new path through the kernel so that would, would mean that that comparison actually succeeds? Uh, so this is just, you know, this is, you know, finding paths through the kernel. It's not necessarily going to find the fact that uh, you've got a, a a buffer overflow or anything, it will just say, "Here's how you got. Here's how to, or help you find. Here's how to get to the buffer overflow. Not actually, you have a buffer overflow." Uh, and so, Kcov is the. You can think of this as the interface. It's the. You have a device somewhere, and this this information that I've presented is is the. Uh, put into a shared buffer between use the kernel and user space, so that such that as a user space program, I can then read it and learn more information about the program, the, the the system calls I've executed. Uh, there's there's alternative interfaces where AFL, which is American, the American fuzzy lop um, fuzzer, and uh, NetBSD. There was a talk just now about from NetBSD about their support for it. Uh, I also have patches for FreeBSD. Um, so it adds support to KCOV. It lets you extract the, the relevant information. Um, but you know, I, I've also got patches in a way of, we can say, well, if you've got a completely different idea of how this should work, I'll let you do that as well. And then I've split out the actual sanitizer from the interface. Um, so we could have in, uh, alternative interfaces. So if anyone has any ideas of uh, what you'd want to do with runtime information about every possible comparison in the kernel, um, uh, let me know. I'm sure we can come up with a module that will give you this information, break the kernel even more. Yeah. Uh, so those those are sort of, you know they're two nice ones to have, but. These are the ones that will actually break your you know, These are the ones that will find tell you uh, your very. These are a lot of useful security vulnerabilities. So address the address space sanitizer is um, check memory. So memory accesses. I uh, you I give you a pointer. You can say it's a it's to a it's a a, a rio say, um, and I give you a link. Uh, what happens if those, the length isn't quite right? And then you try to read it. Or uh, you've got a bug where you actually read one past the length or something similar. The idea with the address space sanitizer is it will catch this sort of thing and it will um, help, it will try to help you find small buffer overflows, not, you know, in the in the range of um, eight bytes uh, sort of area. So it's it's not as going to get you the off by one errors you may find. It won't necessarily help you with a very large 
you're you've somehow managed to corrupt your um, pointer in an odd ways error. But it will find um, so the way it works is it will it will it's got a shadow map. So uh, every eight bytes of kernel address space, you have an extra byte of the shadow map, and then we mark uh, one byte. Uh, what we mark uh, zero to eight bytes of that this buffer. Um, this, these eight bytes is valid, and so every load and store you then have a check to say, is this load going to, is every byte in this load or store valid? Uh, they, it has to be the first zero to eight bytes, um, and they, they must be contiguous. They can't, you can't say, I want the first, uh, third, and seventh byte. It's not going to work, uh, just because of the way the, the format works. Uh, and you can also um, mark... When you're marking memory as invalid, you can you can we've got specific values that will say this is valid because it was a free it's been freed memory and so we know it's a use after free or it is the buff, the padding that you get after malloc so it's a a buffer overflow on the malloc buffer or there's or it is used it is padding between two values on the stack so and it's and it's the top of the or it's the top of the stack or something. You can, you know you get a little bit of information about why you've got your buffer overflow, so you can help helps you you know search to see what you've done wrong. Uh, so how it works is this is your memory. You've allocated. You know, I've given you three examples of memory that's been allocated. You could have say uh, you've got three bytes there. And because because it always ASAN works on eight byte chunks, therefore um, you always you want to get the extra five bytes at the end. So you've got three bytes of memory valid and five bytes invalid, or you could have every every byte valid or nothing. Uh, and so you, at the top you'll see there's a white box which is n. So n is just the this. <laughs> The equivalent there, this blocks shadow memory, so it's a it's, it's a fixed offset. Uh, it will say, depending on the value of n, it will mean that if n is positive, you have some number of uh, zero to uh, one to seven bytes are valid. If n zero, all bytes are valid, and if n is negative, then nothing is valid. Uh, so. Like I said, all all allocation does this mean all allocations have to be at least eight byte aligned, which so it's going to cause a little bit of overhead and memory overhead. Uh they have to and they have to be aligned to an eight byte sized because of the, the way it works. Um which means that small uh over a small um buffer overflows are detected. And then you can add on uh, by default, I think we're at FreeBSD adds one byte, or will we'll, we'll, when I implement it add one, one byte, a uh, one block of uh, eight bytes afterwards. But you could imagine if you think there's going to be a lot, if you've got a larger overflow, we could add more if we need to. Uh, and I, I, because I've copied this, I'm using the same runtime as NetBSD, I believe they'll be the same. So here's an example. I Hopefully this one doesn't have any buffer overflows. Uh, I'm asking, I've allocated some memory, and uh, if you're not familiar with FreeBSD, uh, the, this is just a, a malloc, which MTM just says, give me a temporary value that I don't care about the type, it's just a certain type to say, for later, to say, the tracking of who's using memory. And wait okay means I'm happy with sleeping um, as long as you, so it guarantees that the, the value will, a, a non-null value that uh, will be returned. So memory, so I don't need to bother with a null check in this case uh, because it's guaranteed that it will be valid. And I get some memory, I get some data, so I call a function, pass the, this pointer in, and I want to return it. So I copy it into the, onto the stack and free, free the, uh, the um, the malloc memory. I'm only using in this case. 
I'm using malloc just because, um, just to show you that how it would work with that. Um, you can imagine that this is actually more complex than that in malloc and free, maybe in different functions, but we'll ignore, you know, this is a simplified case. So what's happening? It allocates the memory. In this case, because I said it's eight, it has to be eight bytes aligned and eight bytes sized, it will allocate the first eight bytes. And it's rounded up to a second buffer, so we can do buffer overflow detection of um, guaranteed. Then we'll have something after the buff after the memory we've allocated, and only the first four bytes are marked as, as valid. We then put in some data into the shadow map, so uh, we say four bytes are valid in the first entry, and if B. Um, is saying it's a, a, buff, a malloc buffer. So it's saying it's going to, if we do a buffer over, have a buffer overflow there, we'll know that it's from a malloc, uh, reading past the end of a malloc array. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I say the first half is valid and I apparently forgot to write the second buffer, uh, the second block is marked as, as malloc. Uh, so load, a load of store that includes bytes uh, 14 through 15 will be detected uh, as long as it's in code that's been annotated, you know, uh, it's run through, been built with the sanitizer enabled. Uh, and we can either then, well, if we detect that, we can then either use printf or panic. So panic will stop the world. Printf will just say, you've done something naughty. Uh, a load or store, and a, a load or store outside of this range may or may not be detected. Like we, this yeah, KASN doesn't necessarily give you get perfect security. It's not a security tool. It's going to just give you an idea. Uh, so the, my example again. Uh, what happened? What we what will, what the compiler will do is. In malloc, we set up that shadow map, and we'll insert it, and we have a function inserted by the compiler. So this ASAN node four will implement the the checks on the shadow map. Um, there is a you know so it will be it, it knows the compiler already knows size of you know an, an integer is four bytes obviously. Uh, so it will know to insert the four byte wide thing, uh, check. And exactly what ASAN load four does is runtime dependent. So uh, the NetBSD code that we use and NetBSD users will then do a lookup on the shadow map, um, check that you're, you've got valid memory, and depending on how you build it, pan, you know, do the, the panic or the printf. If instead we were to do this, and I've, if you note the differences, here I'm reading data, data zero, and here I'm reading data one. Now I've inserted, actually I've inserted a, a buffer overflow. Uh, this will then move uh, to the next, but the next um, entry, so data plus you know, four bytes later, and say, well, you know, what is, what's the value then? And we'd hope that the load f the code will then detect this buffer overflow. It's, 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 um, it will print and then print a message saying exactly where it was. And because it's right beside the use, hopefully that should then mean we'll be able to figure out exactly where in our code the issue was. A question? Uh, the, so the question is, does it work with zone allocators? Um, yes, except in one case where I've got a panic. Uh, if you know about zone allocators, if you know about UMA, I'd like to talk. <laughs> I'm not, uh, as I, I've actually got the answer there. Yeah, uh, so NetBSD's had this for a long time, for a year. Um, I've had a, a, a summer of code student working on it. Uh, who did a lot of, you know, got a lot of the work, and we managed to get a successfully booting FreeBSD uh, on, ARM, on AMD64. Uh, this was with my previous runtime, which I decided I didn't like. Um, 
Uh, post after the time of code, I've now I've also now ported to the FreeBSD the NetBSD runtime, and I have pushed it to a GitHub branch if people are interested in playing with it. Uh, I am currently testing and trying to break it, and I have found you know one one known issue in UMA that is with my my use of my case KSN side, not UMA side. So K, it's the problem I've got is with my code, not with the existing code so far. Um, and because of the way it works, it will, when we free, we also mark memory as invalid. It will also detect use after free, which is nice. Uh, so there's another useful, interesting um, um, sanitizer called the uh, hardware-based, hardware-assisted one. Uh, so, ARM64 has support for a thing called top byte ignore, where we can mark the top byte of pointers as uh, tell, tell the hardware to just ignore the value in there. It doesn't. It's going to be could be anything. Uh, and then we, uh, we enable if you enable it in uh, in the hardware, we can then on, on every check we can then say. What if you've got, you know, we could then use that value as, a, as some information about whether or not this is a, a valid pointer or pointing at valid memory. Uh, so, so what it will do is it will store an 8-bit eight, eight tag in, this, in, this, you know, in the field. And then as the hardware will ignore it and loads and stores, we can then, when we, and we instrument the code, we can then use, load, check it then, but we don't have to do modify the pointer to... to Remove it. Um, it's uh, this is an ARM64 specific thing. Uh, is I don't I'm not I don't know of any other hardware, any, any other architecture that supports something similar. Um, there will leave nothing that FreeBSD supports or, or runs. Uh, it does mean you have to allocate you you then allocate random tags. Um, in such a way. So we start off with uh, white here is all is just the default, so un unallocated memory. So uh, we've got a we uh, start off saying the point you know the when you do a load or store that's going to go to become that, that memory is invalid. Uh, we do some allocations. And so, in this case, uh, memory addresses one and two have been marked as blue. And so, uh, your pointer has to have the correct flag, whatever the color, whatever number it is for blue, uh, to uh, to load that memory. And then, eventually, you know, we'll do some more allocations. There may not be, and there may you may have gaps and things, but it's fine. As long as um, later on, if you want to set, then load from from memory location three with a blue a pointer that's been marked as blue. Uh, you it will fail. This one has the advantage of, of it means that uh, you, you you can get you can say well larger out of bounds allocations are more likely to fail because if we have we even if we've got a valid even if we've allocated memory there if we haven't allocated the memory with the quick with the quick tag it will fail. Uh, but it does, um, and it does also. It also gives you uh, use after free, uh, because as you when you uh, free memory, it will clear the ta clear the tag on that me that piece of memory. Uh, it does. You you do only get so you add one byte of kernel address space per six, uh, per sixteen bytes allocated. And therefore, you need memory needs to be 16 bytes aligned. Uh, you don't need to do a. You don't need a. Um, because the, it's, if you're allocating your the, the tags randomly, you can use a probabilistically to, uh, method of saying, well, the, probably the next allocation is a different colour or a different, has a different value. So we don't necessarily we don't need to do a, allocate a, a pad, any padding for slightly out of bounds. It does mean that you lose, uh, you don't get the, um, if you're only one byte out of bounds on a seven byte allocation, it won't detect that. 
but it will detect if you're 16 bytes out of bound. Uh, so you, can't, you won't necessarily get a slightly out of bound uh, failure. Um, and because, and you'll get this just, it's just slightly under, because of your, a few values other, uh, a few uses are um, reserved, you'll get a bit under a one, in, one in 256 bit um, probability of getting the wrong color, of getting um, the correct the color of your pointer when you shouldn't have. Um, I don't know of any, I only know of Linux implementing this, so if anyone wants to do this on uh, FreeBSD or NetBSD or OpenBSD, come and talk to me. I'll be interested in the uh, runtime. Uh, then oh, then, then uh, we've got Cherry, which is, if you were in Brooks's talk this morning and not, not tomorrow, because um, then you would were, you were have learned all about Cherry, or go and have a look on the, the, um, the videos when they were posted later. Uh, it's basically you we say point, make pointers long bigger store bounds uh, more likely uh, bounds in there um, and if you use a few, and make sure they're non forgeable so that if I've given if you've got a capa this capability you can't possibly use it to access memory outside of the bounds no matter how much you try uh, and you also we also get some nice features like bounds and permissions. Um, and they, they can only be derived from other capabilities, so you can only shrink them, you can't expand them. Uh, and go back in time and see Brooks's talk this morning if you're interested in learning more about this. Uh, there was, we should, we should see some hardware, some experimental hardware there soon, in, in a few years, with this, and as Arm is, is interested and have been working on this. Uh, yeah, so we can say we can detect um, all, as long as we are capable, if the capabilities are uh, set up correctly, we can detect out of bounds. And not just, you know, we, if you've got a large allocation, we, won't, we may miss a slightly out of bounds um, uh, access, but we'll detect a large out of bounds access because. Um, there's no tag collision and, and you know, KH, the, the hardware is saying. Um, we've got interesting work ongoing on, so this has been ported to the kernel. We have got a kernel that will boot to user space with a full, every pointer is a capability. Uh, and we've got work on hardware, on, um, Reducing bounds, so arrays inside of struts will have bounds on them, for example, uh, with sub-object bound, um, bounds. Um, but they may need annotations. Yeah, KQ is the main one. Uh, uh, Q dot, sorry, is the main one. Though. Uh, lastly, memory is... Um, turns out, you know, uh, it's possible to read accidentally write memory, you know, to accidentally read memory before you've written to it, uh, which is undefined exactly what will be in the memory. Um, and if your reading memory is passed out to the user space, then you could accidentally leak information. Uh, so KMSAN is a, um, it will do this, it will check, it will say, you've just had, we store a bit to say, is this memory being initialized? And then on use, it will uh, check is, if this is valid. Uh, use is a wee bit interesting in this, and it's, it's uh, used in the conditional, so using an if statement or while statement, or pointed to reference or copied out to use the space. Um, the last one is there to stop leaking information to the user, to, out of the kernel. So here we go, here's an example of you know, we create a variable, uh, B equals A is not in a use in this case. It, it's not because it's not in a conditional. It's not being used to change the, to, in the flow of the program. It's just an assignment. So prop, that will mean that the fact that A is uh, uninitialized will propagate to B. Uh, and then on copy out, which is copying from user space to kernel, uh, kernel to user space, uh, then we'll warn that you've done an uninitialized You've, you've, you've used it at that point. 
or our second uh, less, uh, more surprising one uh, use is um, this, this code. So C equals A plus B. The, uh, that's not considered a use. But the, it, it's, the, if C will become or have a flag set depending on if, um, if, if the flag value was set or not. So if we went through the if, if case in this, uh, this condition, then C will be set as, a, as, as being initialized, otherwise it will be cleared. And then later on, we use the flag again to, to know if we want to copy it out. So that in that case, C will be initialized copy out. I'm assuming B is initialized in this example. Uh, and a slightly more complex one, uh, this is you know, in the conditional. So um, when you allocate memory, it will mark it all as uninitialized unless, um, uh, unless you've uh, explicitly said not to. And uh, then the, you know, on, the on the reading of the flag, it will, um, depend, it will say, well, you haven't actually initialized this. It's invalid use. Uh, like case hand uses a shadow map. Uh, one, it only needs, it needs one bit per byte, so each, each uh, byte of memory has a bit in the shadow map somewhere to say, has this been initialized or not? Um, which, uh, when you allocate, memory is poisoned and unpoisoned, and when you zero it, or, or allocate it right to it in some way, it's unpoisoned. And the shadow space is propagated, so when you do an assignment, we, we propagate the state. Uh, so that when you actually use it later, then it will, will know. Uh, then lastly, uh, for memory allocators, is k-leak, K which is similar uh, by here, is now deprecated, is likely to be deprecated in NetBSD, uh, where it uses, because it uses in-band signaling, so it's more likely to, you'll get false positives. Um, it uses a value, when you allocate memory, you'll put a known value in, and on copy out, you check if that value is in your point, is in your um, structure you're copying out. Um, with some information, you know, they, they've gone and done some science and looked at least likely, value, least likely one byte values to have been copied out and use those and rotate them. And there's a paper on this if you're interested. Uh, it doesn't, it's not because it's uh, in-band signaling, it may detect, may get false positives. Um, and threading is, threads are hard. There is a there is a kernel T T -SAN. Um I'm not sure what status is. I the last commit I saw is in March to the, the the Linux tree from Google. So I'm not I don't know exactly. I haven't looked recently if there's any, any, any progress um, that they haven't uh, anywhere else. Uh, but so why um, find bugs? That is my run. Uh, Wait, you know, fuzzing, which I'll talk about soon, is, you know, it helps, you know, needs, often needs this sort of thing, and it makes, it makes fuzzing much more powerful. Uh, especially the comparison example I, I gave you is that it will feed, you know, makes the, the fuzzing can feed back. And um, as you make uh, fuzzing more likely to find code paths, it makes it more likely to find bugs. So it basically feeds back in on, you know, if you can make it easier to find bugs, you'll find more bugs. So there's two fuzzers I'm going to talk about. The first is SysKiller. It's, from, it's a project from Google uh, where it, will, it understands a lot about different system calls. Uh, it is, it's, um, all three of NetBSD, OpenBSD, and FreeBSD are uh, supported by it. Uh, and so what it, what it will do is it find, it will, it is good at finding new ways, new and interesting ways of panicking the kernel uh, from user space, uh, which may, um, by, by composing different system calls together. Uh, as you can see, this was, I, uh, this is from bef uh, earlier in the year, uh, we can, it will give you a list of panics. You know, Google will provide, um, provides this. Um, but you'll note that there's only one, there's now two, but there was, at the time there was only one um, 
process uh, one of these fuzzers running, uh, which is CI FreeBSD main. Uh, there's now a second one which is for FreeBSD, which is running on I386, so if you're wanting to find Compat 32 issues. Uh, compare that to Linux, where they've got you know, different, they have different compiled options, they have mini KA SAN, they have KM SAN. So it would be nice if, you know, the, uh, the BSDs, I think BSDs might have KA SAN enabled by default. I'm not sure. I, I saw some KA SAN panics when I looked earlier. Um, so it works by, it will try to find you new paths through the kernel. Uh, it uses the comparison sanitizers to say, uh, I've given you this data, I see these comparisons that you possibly use this data. If I try to change it um, to, to what the other side of the comparison is, does it now, move, does it now get into the, a new code path? Uh, it, so it's very good at this is how it works. At, you know, it's good at finding these bugs in the kernel by um, using feedback information back from the kernel. Uh, it understands various arguments and how they relate to each other, and it will do things you don't expect. It will take a socket and then pass the value in because that's a file descriptor. It will then pass it into something that definitely doesn't expect to ever be a socket passed in and see what happens. Uh, it will try to, uh, it will um, do you know, so many different things that you don't expect that uh, is where you, 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 your initial kernel um, crashes all happen. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's very good at panicking the kernel. Um, and it will try to find you a reproducer, so it will give you a C test case, if it can find one. Um, adding sanitizers makes things you know, a lot easier to find these bugs, though. So this is, this is why a sanitizer is good, is that if, if we do that, uh, it will, it will you know, if we add the sanitizers, it will find more bugs. We can fix them. We can hopefully make better claims about you know, fewer bugs in our kernel than, than before. Uh, so it will give you, if it finds a panic, it will give you some information. It will give you the stack trace, for example, because this is, this is just the standard. Naturally, this just comes out of FreeBSD anyway on the panic. Um, it, if you look down the bottom, it's found uh, there was a log, you'll see the information is there was a log. Uh, it will give you a syscada reproducer, which is just a textual description of system calls and how it ran things. And it will find you a C reproducer if it can, uh, which you can then download and then try to reproduce locally. Uh, it will email, there's a mailing list. Join the mailing list of the appropriate one for your BSD or, of your, or operating system of your choice. Um, when you fix, if, when people fix things, if they tag them, then syscall will detect this. It, it follows, it will follow as it um, pulls a new source code, your new changes. It will detect that you've got a fix for something or other. It will give you an email address to say reported by, um, and then it will check that you have actually fixed it. Uh, AFL, which is American Fuzzy Lop, is it's a file system. It's a file format fuzzer. Uh, I'll skip over this wee bit, but I have, as the NetBSD talk was, previously was about this, uh, there's been patches, and I found them to be slow, unfortunately. Um, if you've got ideas of speeding, perform, improving performance of this, I'll... Uh, so, conclusion, fuzzing's good. <laughs> <laughs> Synthesizers are good for fuzzing. Uh, we, uh, we have K we have KCOV, we have UBSAN. Um, ASAN seems to be a good one of finding bugs. Um, other ones need, need more work. Uh, Google will fuzz for you if you give them enough, if you ask them to, which if you're running one of the BSDs they've done already. Um, and you know, look through these reports if you're interested in this. Uh, any questions? Yes. Perhaps I missed it, but where can the reports be found? 
Uh, is there a mailing list or... There is uh, syskiller.epsupport.com, I think. Pardon? I think syskiller.epsupport.com. I, well, if you ask me that after the, afterwards, I can find it. Okay. I email you a link. I'm interested in the work on coverage. Uh, did you use uh, any of the hardware facilities like CoreSight on ARM or Intel PT for that? No. The, so the coverage synthesizer just uses the... Uh, the compiler to insert, uh, um, yeah, in, in, insert probe points basically into your code. Um, yeah, I have talk, we have thought about using these sorts of tools on, on ARM and x86, um, but it depends a little bit on if they are implemented in hardware, which is, may not be the case on ARM. Um, so yeah, if you if you got ideas about that, then yeah, let's have a beer yeah. later. Any more questions? So when you're using the, the sanitizer and coverage, to, coverage tools, I, I guess that the coverage tool cannot coverage itself, as it will cause a recursion and feedback loop and uh, buffers. Yeah, we have, yes, you have to be very careful to build the coverage tool without coverage enabled. Right, so that was my question. <laughs> yeah, the, sanit the, the one times you have to build without the sanitizer support, otherwise yeah, things get very recursive very quickly and you don't even get to the first printf. Any more questions? No, in that case, uh, thank you for your presentation.